So everyone, thank you for uh, for coming um, to uh, Maccabi World Union uh, program, Miraculously Sports Stories, as it's uh, it's the best time to talk about uh, miracles um, uh, in general, but uh, for us in sport. Uh, tonight, the moderator will be Ido Aoni. Um, Ido Aoni is a distinguished professor for international relationship and uh, relations in New York University. Um, and is also uh, a guest lecturer at the Tel Aviv University Color and School Management. He's a co-founder, consult consultancy, Emerson Rigby, a co-founder and management and managing partner in investment company EA2K, a member of the International Advisory Council of APCO Worldwide, a member of the Global Advisory Board of Investment for Value Base, Global Ambassador for us from Maccabi World Union, a member of the Board Governors of Tel Aviv University, co-founder and Global Ambassador of the Genius 100 um, Visions, um, and the Chairman of the uh, Cherny uh, Forum for New Diplomacy. Um, you know, he's a 25 years veteran of the Israeli Foreign Services, public diplomacy specialist, founder of uh, brand Israel program and a well-known nation branding uh, um, pr uh, pr practitioner. Um, Aoni has been Israel's longest serving council general in New York and the, uh, in the three-state area to date. He held that position with a rank of ambassador for six years until 2016, overseeing the operation of Israel's largest diplomacy mission worldwide. Um, so we are honored, Ido, um, and you will present also our distinguished guest that will speak, to, will have this conversation with you. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dana, and happy Hanukkah to all of you and uh, greetings from near Jerusalem. I'm not exactly in Jerusalem. I'm a bit outside of Jerusalem. And I wanted to thank you, Dana, for initiating this uh, wonderful session. And I know we're, we're all in for a very, very special treat. Uh, before I introduce our esteemed guests, uh, Dan Mariashin and uh, Ira Burko, two people that I've known for many, many years, I would like to acknowledge the presence of some of our leaders. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of uh, our global CEO, Eyal Tiberger, who is from Tel Aviv. Hi, Eyal. Hi, Hi thank uh, you. Yes. And then uh, I also would like to acknowledge the presence of Amir Gissin, former Consul General uh, to uh, Toronto and uh, the person who brought me on board to Maccabi World Union. Amir has been associated with Maccabi since childhood and is a pillar of uh, Maccabi World Union uh, in North America. Uh, we have with us uh, the legendary Tal Brody, a dear friend of mine uh, for many, many years, who is uh, an icon, a national and international icon of Israel and the Jewish people. And I'm, I'm always uh, amazed, Tal, uh, how, uh, how much you are able to give from yourself to the community because you, you're, you're omnipresent. You're all over the place. I see you almost in every event, and I'd like to thank you for everything that, you, that you're doing. I've been following you. Uh, thank you, Alan Sherman, for joining us, uh, leader of uh, Maccabi USA. And of course, all the other esteemed guests here. Um, I don't know all of you personally, but I'm, I'm eager to get to know you. Um, we are honored to have two very special people with us. Um, I will start the, the program with a 15, 20 minute interview with each. I'll start with Ira Burko and then Dan Mariashin. And then uh, we'd like to open the floor for your questions and your stories because this session is being recorded and, um, uh, and we're going to post it online, maybe after doing a bit of, of editing. I'd like to start my introduction actually with Dan Mariashin, who will be our second guest. Dan is the long standing chief executive officer of Bnei Brith International. Those of you who don't know, Bnei Brith International is one of the largest Jewish organizations in the world and the parent organization of the Anti-Defamation League that was born out of um, Bnei Brith International. Dan was born and raised in New Hampshire and got his academic degrees from the University of New Hampshire and later on stayed in New England, got a degree from 
uh, from Brandeis. As the CEO of Bnei Brief, he supervises its programs, activities, and staff countries around the world where Bnei Brief is organized, just like Maccabi World Union. And I know that uh, this event is also right now live on Facebook, available for Bnei Brief massive uh, membership. Dan also serves as director of Bnei Brit Center for Human Rights and Public Policy. And in that capacity, he traveled um, all over the world and met with countless heads of state, prime ministers, foreign ministers, opposition leaders, influential members of the media and, cler and clerical leaders. Each time his goal has been to advance human rights, help protect the rights of Jewish communities worldwide and promote better relations with the state of Israel. Um, I should say that before he joined Bnei Brith, he worked uh, with the ADL, joined them in 1977, and then later on moved to work with APAC. We all know APAC, and uh, even had a stint as a press secretary to the Secretary of State, Alexander Haig, during his 87-88 presidential campaign. Um, Dan has not only a vast knowledge of the world of sports, but also a very moving and unique family connection to sports and in particular to uh, the NBA. And we will hear more about it today. Our first guest um, is a person who's one of the best storytellers I've met in my life. Ira Burko, born in Illinois is a renowned and critically acclaimed and celebrated American sports writer, columnist, and reporter. He shared the 2001 Pulitzer Prize, um, which was awarded to the staff of the New York Times for their series, How Race is Lived in America. He earned his degrees from uh, the University of Miami, uh, from Miami University and Northwestern University. Uh, he is from Chicago, very proud uh, to be from Chicago, and uh, started his career working for the Tribune in Minneapolis, and then moved to the New York Times, where he worked from 1981 to 2007, uh, and also wrote for other esteemed publications, such as uh, the New York Times Magazine, Art News 17, Chicago Magazine, the Chicago Tribune Magazine, National Strategic Forum Review, Reader's Digest, and Sports Illustrated, among others. Uh, also Esquire magazine. Um, he wrote no less than 25 books, uh, unless you published more books since the, your bio was published. And the famous novelist uh, Scott Turo wrote about him, Ira Burko is one of the great American writers without limit limitation to the field of sports. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. I've known Ira for many, many years, always enjoyed his company always enjoyed his ability to tell stories and his stories are always smart interesting and inspirational good to have you with us ira well thank you ito it's good to be with you again it's always about a pleasure to be with you and you're such a such a legendary writer tell us what's the most amazing thing that you encountered in the world of sports in your throughout your illustrious career well, I've, I've been doing sports for over 50 years. Um, and for the purposes of this program, perhaps, uh, one of the most um, moving uh, moments for me in my, in my career was covering the 1972 Munich Olympics. And uh, I was there looking for a synagogue and it was very hard to find. And I finally found one. Uh, I was led to one on the second floor of an apartment building. And uh, there was no identification on the, on the mailbox or the bell. But I was told to ring that bell and go up to the second floor, and which I did. And I met a, a couple there uh, who had gone through the Holocaust. And uh, after the Holocaust, they, of course, they survived and they moved to Israel, but they still felt that Munich was their home. So they moved back to Munich. And uh, I met them and, and the, as the, uh, the Olympics were going on, 
uh, the woman, I, I forget her name right now. It may have been Abramowitz, I forget right now. But anyway, um, uh, she said that at home watching the opening ceremony of the uh, 72 Olympics in Munich, and when the Israeli team walked into the stadium, she had tears in her eyes. And I contacted her after the tragedy. And she said, I was watching the television and I was watching uh, Olympic uh, uh, coverage. And now I had tears in my eyes again, but they were different kind of tears. And uh, to me, that was one of the most moving uh, moments of my 50 plus years as a sports writer. And, um, and you know, you one told, once you told me a story that to me brought all of my worlds together. Um, it's something that happened to you, an encounter, a rare encounter that happened to you in downtown Cleveland. And you were there <laughs> to cover the NBA playoffs. Uh, the Chicago Bulls playing the Cavaliers. Can you yeah. share with us the story? Yeah. Um, I went there. The Bulls were playing the Cavaliers in Cleveland in the playoffs, as you, as you said. And I was there to do a story on Michael Jordan, who was quite a prominent basketball player, as I'm sure you know. And uh, uh, so uh, after the, the work, I visited the, the Bulls workout uh, at the, in, the, in the gym. And uh, I saw Michael, and who I knew, and uh, I said uh, uh, the uh, the Knicks were playing the Charlotte Hornets that Sunday afternoon on on television. Michael's game was on Monday, the following day, and so I said, uh, "Will you be watching the the uh, Knicks uh, Charlotte Hornets game?" And he said, uh, "Yeah, I, I'm going to be watching it." Uh, I said, "Where are you going to be watching it?" And I and he said. Uh, well, I have a suite in the Ritz Carlton in Cleveland. So I said, uh, well, could you use company? He said, uh, sure, uh, come on up. And um, so uh, we parted. And uh, then uh, shortly after, um, I went to the Ritz Carlton, maybe an hour, hour, hour and a half later. And as I'm getting on the elevator to go up to the, the floor where Jordan was staying, uh, I guess it was a, a VIP uh, uh, floor. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Hello? Hello? Okay. Yeah, so, go ahead. Okay, so I guess it was a VIP floor. But anyway, uh, a relatively elderly couple uh, got on the elevator with me. And they were speaking what I thought was Hebrew. I don't know Hebrew. I know some Yiddish, but I don't know Hebrew. But, and the man looked very familiar to me. And uh, as we're going up, uh, I was thinking that could it be him in Cleveland? And we get off the elevator and I said, excuse me, uh, but uh, I don't mean to uh, 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 interrupt you, but uh, are you Abba Iban? And he said, yes, I am. And I said, well, I, uh, I want to would say that how much I admired you uh, during the Six Day War and when you were at the United Nations and uh, and we're watching on television how, how dramatic and how eloquent you were uh, in defense of Israel. And um, so I just want to say that as a Jew, I was very, very proud of you. And he said to me, uh, <clears throat> uh, I said, what are you doing here? And he said there was a, a distinguished rabbi in Cleveland who was retiring. I don't remember his name. You might know it, Vito. And, uh, and he said, um, uh, I'm here. I was asked to make remarks at his retirement uh, dinner. And so I, I came up from Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, came up from Israel uh, to speak. And, uh, and then he said, who are you? What are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm a, a sports writer, sports columnist with uh, the New York Times. And uh, I'm here to see uh, Michael Jordan, who's down the hall. And there was a blank look on his face. And his wife said, 
uh, uh, Abba, who, who's, Abba, who's Michael Jordan? And there was a look of total non-recognition in his face. And he, as a great politician, he turned to me and he said, you tell her. <laughs> and I said, well, Michael Jordan is, is the great uh, basketball player in America and blah, blah. And so we parted. So I go down the hall. I knock on Jordan's door. He answers the door and sweats. I said, Michael, you won't believe what just happened. He said, what's that? <laughs> I said, I just met the only man in America who doesn't know who you are. He said, who's that? I said, Abba Iban. And there was the same look of non-recognition on his face that Abba Iban had for him. And he said, who's Abba Iban? I said, well, he's the great Israeli diplomat. And he said, and he didn't know who I am? And I said, that's right. He said, good, he won't ask me for tickets. <laughs> and, I watched the rest of the game. <laughs> and, and Ira, this story it moves me today as, I, as it moved me the first time I heard it many years ago. And I, I've told it myself many, many times because it really brings the, the, the worlds together. You, at the end of the day, you want people to know, um, you know, this is really what connects cultures and, 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 uh, and nations. Now you you um, you authored so many books. You edited so many books. Um, you had great conversations with uh, some of the greatest athletes, and you got to know them as human beings, not only as as performers. And so I wanted to ask you the the since the introduction of the concept of the greatest of all time, the goat, and uh, the last dance. Uh, that was on Netflix and uh, LeBron James's uncompromising demand to be recognized as the best of all times. What do you think about this whole debate? Is there a goat? Um, there are several goats. <laughs> I mean, going back to the beginning of, uh, well, of, of, of uh, organized, really organized basketball or leagues in the, uh, in the 1940s, um, there was George Mikan, who dominated for years, for a handful of years, as a center in the NBA. Um, you know, and and uh, um, of course Jordan, uh, and before Jordan, Jerry Jerry West, uh, uh, Will Chamberlain, uh, Bill Russell. Uh, you can't do better than Bill Russell. Bill Russell won eleven uh, NBA championships in thirteen years, and in one of those two years that he didn't win the championship. Uh, he didn't play the seventh game because he had a sprained ankle uh, against the uh, St. Louis Hawks. Um, you know, I mean, LeBron is great. Uh, Michael is great. Uh, um, uh, after he won his three championships, he, uh, he left to, to play baseball for a year and a half. Uh, and I went down to Birmingham. Uh, he was playing for the Birmingham Barons baseball team, uh, double A. And, uh, and I said to him, why, why did you leave? basketball. He said, well, I've done all I could in basketball. I wanted to do, I won uh, three championships. And to me, that was, that was enough. I said, well, remember Bill Russell won 11. And he said, I just didn't have the same interest. Uh, of course, a year and a half later, Jordan came back, won three more championships. Uh, and LeBron has won a couple. He may win another one coming up, but, um, uh, it's there are just so many. There have been so many great players um, that it's hard to say just one is the best of all time. I think, I think for argument's sake, people like to pick one, but um, I, I'd have a I'd have a handful. Um, Russell, Chamberlain, Jabbar. Oh, I'm forgetting someone really important. Magic Johnson. At one, I was point, about to mention him. I was uh, about uh, Mag to mention him. Magic Johnson did something which may never be repeated in, in the history of basketball. Uh, in his senior year in Lansing, East Lansing, Michigan, uh, his basketball, his high school basketball team, he led it to the state championship. Then he graduates, he goes to uh, uh, Michigan State, plays on a freshman team, but uh, and then is, he, uh, he joins the varsity and he wins the NCAA championship. The next year, he leaves uh, uh, Michigan State after a sophomore year, and he joins the Lakers 
and he leads them to an NBA championship. And so in three years, uh, in, in, out of four, three out of four years, in three different uh, elements of, of, of basketball, high school, college, and, and the pros, he wins championships. I mean, I don't think that that will ever be, be topped. Uh, and, um, and then he's a, he, now he's a uh, first year in the NBA and uh, his, uh, the Lakers are playing the 76ers uh, in the, uh, was it the, the 1980 uh, NBA championship? Or was it 81? I forget now. Uh, but anyway, uh, Jabbar, who is the great center, uh, he's, he's ill in Los Angeles. I think he had a migraine headache. He couldn't play. Magic Johnson, who was now the great point guard for the Lakers, had played center in high school, 6'9". And he also changed the way basketball is played uh, uh, for point guards. A 6'9 point guard was almost unheard of. And so he... Um, uh, the coach says, uh, Jabbar uh, is out. We need a center. And you played center in high school. And so it uh, turns out that um, uh, he plays a great, great game. He leads in scoring and assists and whatever. And uh, it's the sixth and final game of the series. Uh, it was the fourth win for the Lakers. And, they, of course, they win the championship. And uh, <clears throat> But I, I had wrote at uh, recalling that, I said that the the greatest center in the NBA and the greatest forward in the NBA and the greatest guard in the NBA is the same person. It's Magic Johnson. And uh, he was just extraordinary. Now, can you, one last question before we, we turn it to Dan Mariashin and then to our group discussion. Uh, can you separate greatness from personality greatness on the court and off the court because i remember i asked you we we've had conversations before about this and you said something to me about magic that i'll never forget you said that when the team lost he would send some he would take the microphone he would stand in front of the media when the team won he would let someone else do it um he, he how, and larry how can bird. You, yeah and larry bird he and larry bird we used to yeah. do that yeah yeah, and so uh, can you can you separate athletic greatness from you know the personality of the of the athlete? I think that uh, the personal greatness is generally uh, how my team does. I have to lead my team to a championship. Uh, some wondered if if Wilt wasn't selfish, um, but uh, uh, I I don't think so. I think I think Wilt wanted to to win. Uh, he didn't like criticism, and um, but um, uh, like Michael, Michael Jordan had such a thirst, and and Magic such a thirst for winning um, that they would do almost anything within the rules. Um, but I do remember that both uh, after a, uh, a the um, the Lakers or the or the Celtics won, um, Magic Johnson and Larry Bird both would go into the, um, the trainer's room where the, the press was not allowed. And so you had to interview some of the other players if you're on deadline. And, uh, and then after about 20 minutes or so, um, I don't know if they ever spoke about it together, but they both did the same thing. Uh, they would come out of the trainer's room and now they would talk to the press after the press had already talked to some of the other players. And when they lost, you walk into the locker room, and of course, they're the, the lead players, uh, even with Jabbar, because uh, Jabbar was a little rec recalcitrant about uh, talking to the press. But um, after the Lakers or the, um, or the Celtics won, uh, you'd walk in, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if they, lo they lost, you walk into the locker room, and there seated in front of his locker was Larry Bird or Magic Johnson to talk to the press. So they were gonna take the burden of the loss to the press incredible incredible stories thank you so much for and and we have with us really the person who changed israeli basketball the same way magic changed uh, professional basketball and that's of course tal brody but tal came to israel we were still playing outdoors but he brought a different standard of of, of practice a different standard of he was really a professional and tal brody almost single-handedly changed israeli basketball and also turned us into a winning 
basketball nation. Uh, so uh, we're very happy. Dan Mariashin, you are from New England, the same place, not far from the birthplace of, of the game and not far from mm -hmm. the, the Hall of Fame, which is in Western Massachusetts. You were from New Hampshire. And, um, and you have uh, some personal connection to the Jewish uh, uh, dimension of the game. And uh, you're able also to connect that story to uh, the current story of Danny Avdia and the Washington Wizards. So why don't we start with that personal connection of yours? Yeah, well, first of all, yes, I was raised about 75 miles north of Springfield, Massachusetts, where the, the Basketball Hall of Fame is. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, living in uh, New England uh, at that time, as a kid in the late 50s through the mid 60s, uh, the Boston Celtics were were kings. Uh, so it was a, it was a good time to be uh, to be raised and to be growing up in, in New Hampshire. So uh, the connection uh, to Jews and basketball goes to my first cousin, Saul Mariash, and actually the same name as my father. Uh, Saul, uh, his father and my father were brothers, born in Brooklyn. Um, his father was a tailor. Saul was born in 1924. And um, as Ira Burkow has written, you know, so about so much, uh, basketball, notwithstanding Indiana and other places, basketball was a city game. And Saul went to Lafayette High School in Brooklyn, same high school as many luminaries, including Sandy Koufax, who came along about 10 years later. Um, and um, was a great ball player at, at Lafayette uh, High School, and um, then went off to Syracuse University. He played a year at Syracuse. Uh, now we're talking about uh, World War II, and he shifted for about a year to Bloomsburg State in Pennsylvania because he was in an, a naval officer's training course. And ultimately did his last two years at Harvard. Now, while he was at Harvard, uh, he was uh, his senior year. He was captain of the Harvard basketball team, um, and um, he was All Ivy League his junior year, uh, senior year, and he led the Crimson to the NCAA playoffs um, for the first time. They were defeated by Ohio State in the first round, uh, but then, of course. You know, it would be 65 years between Saul Mary Ashen and Jeremy Lin uh, that Harvard would again uh, go into the NCAA uh, playoffs. Just a couple of other notes about him. Uh, he played shortstop for Harvard as well. Uh, he was scouted by the Brooklyn Dodgers. Dodgers were always looking for, you know, a Jewish player uh, at that time in Brooklyn. Um, and he played shortstop for, for Harvard. He played against Yale, of course. Uh, and uh, in those Yale games, who was the first baseman? It was George H.W. Bush. So the story goes that, that Saul had a, a box score that he kept in his scrapbook, and his daughter tells this, that in that box score of that game, I think it was 1946, that they were 47, that they lost to Harvard one to nothing. Saul went one for three, George Bush went one for three, but next to Bush's name was a, a red check mark, and then there was a red check mark next to, to Saul's name. So he was a good ball player, he was a good baseball player. Then here's the connection to Denny Avdia. So he finishes great uh, career at Harvard. He's drafted in 1947 by the then Washington Capitals. So not the Washington Capitals, a hockey team, the Washington Capitals, the basketball team. Um, the Capitals, by the way, were coached. This was in the, in the Basketball Association of America. This was in the BAA, which was the forerunner to the NBA. The coach was Red Auerbach. Um, but Saul doesn't wind up with the Capitals. Uh, he uh, somehow makes it to the Celtics. I don't know whether the rights, we still can't, can't figure out whether the rights were sold or whether they were tra traded. Um, and he signed with the Celtics, 47-48 season, uh, starting guard, uh, finished fourth that year in the rookie of the year voting. And uh, in one game against the Knicks at Madison Square Garden, as Casey Stengel used to say, you, you could look it up. Uh, he scored uh, 22 points in that game. Now, 22 points 
1947, I guess was the, the equivalent with, with inflation <laughs> about so 45 points today. He must have had a, had a great game. You know, those games were always 47 to 45 or 65 to 63. Um, one other note, one other, just to, just to finish up about that team. On the Celtics roster in the 47-48 season, there were four Jews. Um, Jews were playing in uh, basket, professional basketball all over the place. You know, people like Red Holtzman, who played for Fort Wayne, and, and of course, Max Zaslavsky played for the Chicago Stags. These were, these were serious stars. And every team, it seemed, had somebody who was Jewish. The Celtics had four. So in addition to Saul, there was Jay Garfinkel and Art Spector and Mike Bloom. And on that team, not Jewish, but went on to a great career as an actor was Chuck Connors, uh, who starred in the Rifleman TV series uh, and also played for the Brooklyn Dodgers uh, uh, briefly. You know, that was a, a time where you had two sport uh, athletes. Some of them would play in, you know, in, in both. Um, and so that's, uh, that's the story of, of Saul. He played one season. Um, who knows what they were making in those days? I have no idea. We probably can check this, but it, it probably was enough for car fare and that was about it. Um, and uh, he got a better offer the next year from his father-in-law to go work in the upholstery textile business. Went out to the West Coast. Two years later, two years later, filling his spot in the backcourt on the Celtics was Bob Cousy. So who knows if, if Saul had stayed with the Celtics, he probably would have been edged aside. I mean, Cousy was an amazing player. So that's, uh, that's the connection. But, you know, when I think about, you know, all of the great players, you know, Tal Brody is, is here and it's great that, to be, that he's with us today. But, you know, you could go through the list. I mean, I've got, uh, you know, Dolph Shays, Danny Shays, uh, Rudy LaRusso, what a great ball player he was. Neil Walk, um, Tal Brody, of course, and, and then the Israelis and Dov Hennefeld and Daron Sheffer. Uh, so, uh, you know, I would say not that uh, Sheffer and Hennefeld had, had NBA careers, uh, but uh, certainly after his very auspicious opening exhibition game, uh, Denny Avdia is in, in that great tradition uh, of, right. of Jewish ball players. Which which uh, leads, which is a beautiful segue to, to my next, next question to you. I happened to be uh, in the United States and when Nadav Hennefeld came to play for the University of Connecticut, and he was viewed by the people in Connecticut as largely responsible for the dream season, which was the first time they were really on the, on the national map. They did not win the championship with Nadav, but they did win the first Big East championship. And um, he became the, the most celebrated, the most well-known Israeli in America. There's no doubt about it. M much bigger than uh, Doron Sheffer later on, because Sheffer came several years later and Connecticut would already, you know, right. had a reputation of a good team. Um, I have a feeling that uh, let me put it this way what do you think is going to um, happen to Danny Avdia in the context of him as an unofficial ambassador of Israel um, in, 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 in the next year? Well I think he's going to have a tremendous impact but, but we have to remember that professional basketball of course is a global sport uh, and the NBA, you know, over the last 20 years, let's say 25 years, you know, more and more, you got players from Spain, players from Argentina, players from Turkey, uh, players from China. So um, it, the, the impact of having a, an international you know, player in the NBA is not something which is unusual. But I think for an Israeli player to be playing, you know, it, it could be anywhere. It's a, it's a league with a lot of franchises, but to be playing in the nation's capital, mm -hmm. um, I think is a, um, you know, it's, it's going to have a real impact. And uh, we're really excited about it here in Washington. We think uh, he can be a great ambassador for the game and he can be a great ambassador for Israel. Uh, and, Ido, and, uh, yes, can I insert, 
can I insert something here that um, talking about sure. great, uh, outstanding college basketball players? There was a player in the late fifties, early sixties who I was friends with. His name was Jeffrey Newman. Played for he was an All Ivy League player two years in a row for the University University of Pennsylvania. And uh, Candace Bergen uh, entered the University of Pennsylvania, and so Jeffrey thought that uh, being the big man on campus, campus, uh, he should give. Uh, Candace a call and ask her for a date. So uh, he gets her number. He calls. She answers the phone. He said, Candace. She said, yes. He said, this is Newman. She said, Paul. <laughs> and the next thing was click. <laughs> <laughs> that, a... that, was the end, that was the end of this conversation at a state with Candace Bird. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff played in Israel also. He played in. He played afterwards in Israel. Oh, did he? Yeah, he was a very good player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, Dan Mariashin also mentioned uh, the late uh, Neil Walk. He he also played in Israel, um, and um, yeah, we remember him. And so, um, so Dan, going back to Danny Abdia in in the United States, you say you think he is going to be um, um, he's going to have a tremendous impact. And how do you think uh, the Jewish, what the Jewish community should do in order to maximize that impact? Well, you know, some teams have, uh, you know, a Jewish heritage night. Uh, you know, you've seen this. Uh, I mean, I remember going to one uh, here in, in Washington where I think uh, Omri Caspi then was playing with Sacramento. And there's a big turnout of folks uh, from our community uh, out to um, the Verizon Center uh, for that game. Uh, I think the community can be can be very proud of him uh, and and can uh, I'm sure that he will be embraced. I'm sure he'll be invited to to speak. Um, he'll be invited to to various events here. Um, and I think you know we're talking about sports, but um, Israel is known as as a startup nation uh, and rightfully so. Um, and uh, we all take a great deal of pride in that. And a lot of non-Jews, of course, recognize that. Uh, we see it now in, you know, in peacemaking. I mean, with the, the Abraham Accords, uh, you know, the, the good things that are going to happen uh, from, uh, from, from those accords in terms of investment and startup nation and so forth. But sports, of course, is the great common denominator. Uh, and especially basketball is, is, is a, basketball and soccer are, are global. So um, I, you know, we right now, Denny Avdi has got to got to concentrate on his game. Uh, clearly, get off to a good start, um, but I think the community will will embrace him. And then when he plays, uh, you know, when they when the Wizards go up to New York, that's that's going to be huge. So yeah, uh, and um, it's exciting. And you know that he, he the New York Knicks almost took him, so he could have ended up with the Knicks, and. Um, and I think that Washington is, is a good place for him. Um, I think that, uh, the, you know, Ira also can speak to that. Um, do you see, and I'll, I'll ask this one last question, both of you, and then we'll open the floor and um, participants who would like to ask questions, they can either use the function of um, the chat or just simply raise your hand like this and I will see you. Um, do you think, um, that there's a difference in the performance of players with audience and without audience, because we were able to see that um, the absence of, uh, you know, the audience in the, in the stadium also uh, releases psychologically. Some of the players are playing differently um, and it happens in soccer. It happens in basketball. It happens in other sports. Um, and of course, the presence of the media. Uh, do you think that all those psychological effects impact the performance of the athletes? And we'll start with you, Ira. Um, I watched the uh, NBA finals to, to essentially no audience. And the play was terrific. Uh, I had always thought that the crowds make a difference. And and in some cases, maybe they do. I remember Walt Frazier, the Knicks, you know, saying that uh, uh, the crowds would, would juice him up. Uh, and I guess performers, that happens to performers. 
But I think at some point uh, the game becomes the game rather than you know the the, the game for the crowd. Um, I, you know, Tal could could speak to this probably. Uh, I'm sure better, but um, I just think that uh, once the game starts, then the the game is the thing, and uh, and your performance in the game is is the thing. You know, I would say, uh, Ido, um, I, maybe it affects the fans more than the players. Um, you know, I'm a big baseball fan. It's watching baseball this past season, and and you miss, even though you know they've got sound piped in. You, you miss that, that crowd noise when something's happening, when there's a rally, when there's something going on uh, or somebody's pitching you know, into the seventh and they've got a no hitter. And you know that there's a certain electricity in the crowd, but I, I agree with Ira, I mean, not being an athlete, but, but just assuming that, that these guys, most of them are so focused um, on their craft that, that that's, that's where they are. I mean, that pitch is coming in, as we're talking baseball, Pitch is coming in at 95 miles an hour. They've, they, they've got to focus on that basketball the same way. So I think, um, yes, there's something missing, but I think in a way it's, it's kind of more for the fans that it's problematic than it may be for the athletes themselves. Maybe we'll ask this uh, question. Uh, we'll ask Tal Brody to answer that as a, someone who played for many, many years. Uh, Tal, when, when you were, Did you feel any pressure the, by the crowd or the, the presence of the media? And not pressure, but inspiration. You know, but as I said, once that ball is thrown up, uh, all the digital people from the NBA teams did a great job every time if somebody's making a basket or there's a change of uh, score or the, they're the digital people that put all the music and all the sounds of the crowd and even the fans now uh, are paying the clubs to have their picture or in cardboard in a, in a certain seat. It doesn't take the place of the crowd. But if I'm a Giannis that, uh, from Milwaukee Bucks that just signed a contract for $228 million dollars for five years, it's the, it's the largest contract, but uh, compared to Steph Curry, He got, I think, 220 for four years. It might be more money, but it's uh, Steph Curry, I think, is still leaving. But when I compare it, even as coming out of the University of Illinois, uh, being the 12th in all-around pick in the draft by the Baltimore Bullets, uh, A. Poland and uh, Buddy Jeanette, and... At the same time with Rick Barry and Billy Cunningham, Bill Bradley, uh, Gail Goodridge, Jerry Sloan, all of us were within the 10 best players of the U.S. We all got contracts for $12,000, $12,500 a year. Now, <laughs> imagine Danny, uh, he's also between three and a half and four million uh, a year. So it's a big difference between David Stern where he took the NBA uh, during the All-Star Weekend in San Antonio. Uh, uh, I'll be back in about 15 minutes, please. Was uh, in the elevator, and my wife and I, all of a sudden, we hear him saying that, you know, uh, David Stern just signed a contract with the NBA for $26 million, and he doesn't even dunk, you know? So, and <laughs> it did for the NBA. You know, all these guys really have to thank them, you know, and it doesn't, the, the television actually got another 18 to 20,000 people viewers. So when they pay $2 billion a year to the NBA, it actually, they, did a, they got a good deal uh, for the EuroLeague in basketball. Uh, it's getting tough for the teams to survive. You know, without any crowds. Uh, but for the yeah. NBA, they're, they're holding their own. Our friend, uh, politics, Fred, yeah, our friend uh, Fred Schoenfeld is um, asking a question. And again, maybe uh, Tal can answer that as well with Dan about um, what is the, the importance or the impact of the fact that we now have a, uh, a, um, par a controlling shareholder 
of a Jerusalem soccer team who's from the Emirates. Uh, you know, obviously, this is a wonderful expression of normalization. And as we like to call it in Hebrew, the fruits of peace. But uh, what is the impact of this beyond, uh, you know, diplomacy and, and geopolitics? We'll start maybe with you, Dan. Well, I think, uh, you know, I would have expected this kind of um, development a little bit later on, <laughs> not at the beginning of this process. Uh, but why should we be surprised? Because there are so many things going on now. You know, business conferences in Dubai and, and tourism now, in two-way tourism, not just, I mean, it's true, many Israelis are going to the Gulf. So a lot of things are happening. I didn't expect this particular development to happen this early on. But then again, um, when, you, when you look at, at soccer as, as the global game, um, and ownership is, is from all over the place. I mean, teams are, are bought and sold all the time. Um, that, you know, in a way, kind of the national character in terms of owning a team, literally owning, not owning as, as fans, this is our team, but also owning in terms of the actual ownership. Uh, I think this is, it's not the wave of the future. I mean, it's, it's the present. So um, it, was, it was a little surprising, but um, if you talk about normalization, I mean, you can't get more normalized than, than the game of soccer or the game of basketball. So I hope this all works out and uh, for everybody in terms of the peace and in terms of, uh, of the game. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the I have a question yeah. for Dell. May yeah. I ask a question? I would, I would say, look at it in a different way. Politically, no problem with any of the sports teams. But in Jerusalem, where it's a city that suffered so many suicide bombings, which affected so many families, you're talking about a team which is probably more anti-Arab because many of the things that happen within families in Jerusalem and the group of which are very, uh, very radical, but it's not their fans. So I would say it's probably the last team in Israel to make an agreement with. I, I really didn't think the agreement was going to be. I thought the Ministry of Foreign Affairs was going to stop it somewhere along the line. But if it succeeds, everything else will be easy. Nothing uh, the, of that, um, the spirit of the Abraham Accord is amazing. And it's uh, one of the, it's the best. It's better for sure than Jordan and Egypt. And to just to give you a hint where I took it, I think that Ira knows very well the name of Sam Vincent that played with Michael Jordan. Yeah. Yeah, I he do. also won the championship with, with uh, Larry Bird. Well, I heard that Sam is the national coach of Buck. So I, I spoke with Sam, and we're going to organize the Abraham Accord for kids, 16-year-old girls and boys. It's going to be virtual between Bahrain, between the UAE, between the New York City public school systems, the, the girls and boys of 16 years old. And I'm organizing in Israel. Uh, three teams, Maccabi Tel Aviv, Kfar Saba, and Herzliya, but also participating are going to be the Arabic teams from the Muslim communities in Baka Al Garbia, in Taibe, and maybe Kfar Qasim. The, uh, why is this thing all the time going off? Uh, from Nazareth, it's the Arabic Christian community. They have very good basketball up there. They're going to be participating, their girls and boys. And also the Arabic Druze, they have, their boys play soccer, but uh, their girls play basketball. So their U16 team are going to participate. All this is going to be happening in, in late uh, January because Sam Vincent, he coached that national Bahrain team and he brought them over and made history in Bahrain that they went in with Lebanon to the Asian F uh, FIBA, Federation of International Basketball, tournament. So that's what's happening with sports. Sport is going to be an amazing success because that spirit between the Bahrainis coming to Israel and the Israelis going there, it's happening. It's already happening. But 
Yeah. You know, they have a saying uh, in Bahrain, uh, you know, like Nike, just do it. But in Bahrain, it's just do it tomorrow. They take their time. <laughs> they build relationships. Yeah, I think Ira, Ira wanted to ask a question. Please, Ira. Uh, yeah, just going back to a previous conversation. But, uh, Tal, would you play any harder uh, in a, a Big Ten game, say, uh, uh, with 20,000 people watching, or you're playing with a very good basketball player one-on-one -on -one in a schoolyard? Will you play any harder before 20,000 people, or would uh, or would you play as hard one-on-one -on -one in a schoolyard against a very good player? I tell you, yeah, that's, you go, that's the ultimate question, the obviously. But um, I, I just wanted to, um, I was more referring to the psychological side of it, the mm. pressure. You know of, that there's so much at stake, especially as Tal mentioned, when you have a player who's uh, just signed a multi hundreds of millions of dollars contract, there's a lot of pressure. The question is that the pressure affects the performance. Uh -huh. And uh, we know that um, the, the people that have the ability to, uh, and I think that in the, in the last dance, what was so beautiful about it is that people were able to describe what was so unique about Michael Jordan, that he was able to live the moment that, particular moment and I thought it was a very profound description of his psychology mm -hmm. uh, because I also I played I was never a professional player but I played in an organized league in Israel and I and I I didn't perform well under pressure as a player um, and um, but uh, but every everybody every person is different um, do we have more questions because I think our time is up and I just uh, wanted before I say goodbye to our wonderful participants and wonderful guests. I also want to acknowledge, I just see that my dear friend, Judge Victor Bianchini joined us from San Diego and Judge Bianchini is a fencer who's been to the Maccabiah games many, many times and um, also was involved in making peace between Israelis and Palestinians uh, as a judge. Um, if we don't have any I more know, questions. I, I sent a question to you and I sent it to Tal. I don't know. If oh, you yes, Alan, you asked, uh, um, uh, you, you asked uh, in light of the Arab countries signing accords and if Saudi Arabia establishes relations, do you think it would be the right time for the Israel Sports Federation to leave the federations they have been re relegated to and try to join the regional federations? Well, the answer to your question is political. Uh, the reason why Israel is competing in Europe and not in Asia is because is political. Uh, as you know, the United Nations membership, which is 193 countries now, when the United Nations was established in 1945, it was only 51 nations. So the United Nations grew dramatically in the last 70, 80 years. And the regions have their own subdivisions. Uh, Israel, for all intents and purposes, were was practically kicked out of Asia. Um, and Tal can, I know that. he can, he can describe what happened in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, but I don't think Israel would like to go back to Asia, if you ask my opinion, my humble opinion. And the reason is very simple. Europe yeah. is very competitive. The reason why Danny Avdia is playing in the NBA or why Omri Caspi was able to play in the NBA, or Nadav Hennefeld and Doron Sheffer played for Division I basketball, is because of the fact that Israeli basketball, Israeli soccer, and other uh, fields became more competitive as a result of the fact that we are being forced to compete in Europe. And I don't know if Tal would agree with that assessment, but I, 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 I will find it hard to believe that Israel will be interested in, in competing in uh, in the in the Gulf region or in the Middle East, we are better off competing in Europe. Also, Israeli clubs are more attractive when we are the bridge to Europe. When you look at uh, why this uh, uh, Emirati Sheikh wanted to invest in a Jerusalem soccer club, because he knows that this soccer club, if they do well, they can compete in Europe, and that's worth a lot of money and the team can, can appreciate. Uh, Tal, do you want to add to that or Dan? 
1976, we played in Tehran, our basketball team, and also our soccer team, and we participated in the Asian Games. Now, because our level in Israel is so above and beyond the Middle Eastern level, I always say when I'm speaking in the States that Israel is the sports capital of the Middle East. If you look what happened in judo, windsurfing, in the last uh, gymnastics, in the last uh, month or two, how many we won European championships and they're participating in our girls in world championships and the world windsurfer, it's true. Now, uh, according to what you said, Alan, if we go backwards, like Ido said, it's not good. But if we go backwards, the difference of the, let's say in basketball, of the level will be embarrassing for the Middle Eastern countries to participate with us. That's why when I'm saying do, to do this Abraham Accord, we should do it with the youth and not with the older teams. So right, uh, what Ido said is right. Yeah. It's not for us to go backwards because our level will be higher. I mean, it's a real compliment for Israeli sports that we got to this way, and that's because of the Maccabea games. It wasn't for the every four years where we can judge <clears throat> the level of Jewish athletes from all over the world and try to develop these athletes, uh, probably Jewish sportsmen will be backward and not as good as the level. But today, Jewish athletes are developing, and our Israeli athletes, because of the Maccabee Games, because we're in the European championships, we're much better off and much higher than any other league. Um, you know, so we're competitive in Europe, but uh, we're not going to go backwards and, and the other countries will be embarrassed of the difference of the scores. Yeah. Well, thank you, Tal. Um, Dan, you wanted to say something about that? No, just, a, just a word, you know, for years, you know, for years we were fighting when various federations, Asian federations, Middle Eastern federations would, would leave Israel out of regional groupings talking about now in, in athletics, we would, we would be fighting that on the basis of discrimination. Um, and we still don't, you know, we want those opportunities to be open for Israel always. Uh, so I'm, I, I'm looking at it from a little bit of a different perspective, you know, from the Jewish community's perspective of the, pro, the pro-Israel pro advocacy community. But it's true that the level of athletics, and I've heard Tal now talk about it, now, uh, after all of these years where Israel has been uh, so, so prominent uh, a member of these leagues in, in terms of, of Europe, uh, it certainly would be, would be hard to go back. But we shouldn't forget you know, that there was a discriminatory aspect to this, uh, which we were fighting for a long time. Right. I'll tell you, and, because uh, of our level, nobody's discriminating. We're the first to be invited today because of the level in the majority of our sports. And so even in Europe, when it was tough in the beginning with anti-Semitism, um, even in China, uh, before the coronavirus, they, Maccabi Tel Aviv, they want to be the first team that they invited to a tournament, which included Iran and Egypt. Now, I, I, I told our club, we have to go because I want to test if Iran will drop out of the tournament and they would lose face between the Chinese, but the Chinese invited us first to be uh, Yao Ming. Uh, you know, he visited right. Israel uh, uh, last year in December, but Yao, he's the chairman. But they invited Israeli team was the first team that they invited to a yeah. tournament in China. Incredible, incredible. Well, we came to a close. Um, before I turn it over to uh, Dana, I just wanted to thank our dear guests Ira Burko and Dan Mariashin. I would like to thank Tal Brody for his guest performance and all of you participants. Uh, you all stayed. None of you dropped out. It's a big achievement for a Zoom session because we know that there's a, a lot of people talk about Zoom fatigue now. And so we're very, very happy that all of you liked it. And uh, we'll make the video available to all of you to share on your social media platform. So Happy Hanukkah to all of you from Jerusalem. And back to you, Dana. Um, thank you again. Um, I'm uh, joining Ido in his thank you notes. Um, thank you to Ido, to Ira, to Dan, to all of you uh, here, to our Shlichim, to Roy Solomon joining us from Maccabi, 
USA, uh, my friends. Um, thank you very much. Um, we will leave the the Zoom uh, the Zoom open, uh, but you uh, but we're um, we're done, and we hope to see you in our next session. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.